Okay, I would like to introduce myself. I'm Alan Chung, the founder and managing director of Grandian Group, and also the chairman of the uh, CSR Committee of Federation of Hong Kong Industries. So besides my footprint in the commercial sector, and actually I'm also the current chairman of the Social Entrepreneurship Forum, which is the annual summit okay, organizer here. Okay, so welcome you uh, to attend this meeting. So I think uh, in the first section, you all heard about BCOP. We heard about the uh, same from Alicia and also from Maria about the force of the BCOP. But right now, we turn into another angle, how the company can proceed BCOP as their strategies, okay? So we are quite, quite happy and glad to have four speakers from all over the world. We have the speakers from Australia, Mr. Glenn Cleese from Aspen Medical. Okay, can you please give us welcome? Yeah, thank you. Okay, are you introduced first? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and also, Mr. Kim from Korea. Okay, Mr. Cheng from China. And Miss Me. And Mr. Me, okay, from China again. So, as we all know, that if we would like to be a big call, you need to pass through a very rigorous business impact assessment. But I would like to know how many of you here have already filled in the B impact assessment? Can you raise up your hand? Well, not so much. Oh, that's great. Because our title today is B Cop in Action. I really hope that after this section, you will be part of us, okay? To enter to be a big cop, okay? So uh, actually, as mentioned by Lishia, in pursuing the big corporation, we are not just talking about doing business because traditionally, uh, we need to shift our mindset from shareholder value maximization to stakeholder value maximization nowadays because we see that or we find that a lot of the social problems nowadays we are facing is created maybe by the business ourselves. How about the polluted area, the climate changes, inequality, the gap between the rich and the poor widen and widen. So I think business is the time to rethink how we can do the business nowadays and be the force to be the change maker in the world. So today we are very glad to invite four speakers from around the world to share about how they become the big corporation and how they proceed in their home country. So first, may I invite Mr. Kim Ang to share with us? Yeah. So our section will be conducted in, two, in, in three dialects indeed. Uh, okay. Hoi, Gong Dong Hua, Phu Tong Kwa, and English. Okay. If you need the simultaneous translation, so please raise up your hand, and our helper will send you the headset to do so. So Mr. Clint, please. So good, uh, good morning to all of you and thank you very, very much for the, uh, the opportunity to talk a little bit around uh, Aspen and around why we chose to be a B Corp and what it means to us as a business and the benefit that comes from that. So uh, I'll just cover a little bit around Aspen as a business. So for those of you who don't know about us, because we're quite a different business, we operate around the world, I'll talk about two key projects that we're involved in and how we've brought our approach to uh, being a B Corp to those. One is the response that we did for uh, several governments uh, around the Ebola response, and the other is the work that we're currently doing in Iraq, looking after the civilian casualties uh, from the war in Mosul. And then I'll, I'll cover out the impacts uh, that we see that are very critical, both internally and externally, around our, our people, our marketing, our customer engagement, business development and finance. 
So we were founded in 2003, um, and uh, we were founded by uh, myself and uh, my best friend, Dr. Andrew Walker. Uh, we started the company back then. Um, we are Australian owned and we are headquartered in Australia. For those of you who don't know, uh, we're based out of Canberra, which is the capital of Australia, uh, but we operate now in uh, 14 countries around the world. We have over 2,000 employees. Uh, we have a very, very strong focus in our history around external audit, accreditation, compliance and transparency. And those provided a, a fantastic foundation for us when we went to get our B Corp accreditation. Um, caring is really in our DNA and it's something that's critical to how we operate and work in the future. So we deliver services across the globe to people like the United Nations, the World Health Organization, Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, the United Kingdom's uh, Department for Foreign Investment and Development, uh, USAID, uh, governments and the Global Fund. Um, this picture, I'll just say, comes from our um, work we did in Ebola. Uh, you can imagine when uh, people are suffering from Ebola, you can't have contact with them. All of our health professionals were all in uh, personal protection equipment. Um, and when people would what we call graduate, when they would survive and come out, um, our staff set up this big wall and every person who survived Ebola uh, would go in and get a, a hand paint and put their handprint up on the wall and sign it. And it was called the Wall of Hope. And we've now brought that back to Australia and it's, it's now in the um, Powerhouse Museum as Australia as a symbol of uh, what uh, commercial and volunteer work was able to do to help people in, uh, in Africa. Um, just a general uh, view to show you uh, where we are based uh, around the world, uh, but we're pretty much on uh, most continents around the world and continuing to grow. I have a short video here which really just covers a lot of the stuff which will allow me to get then into uh, some of the key projects.
So I realise that it's a multilingual audience and uh, we do have a version of that in Mandarin. So if any of you would like a link to that, please let me know after the presentation and I'll provide that to you. I'd just like to provide a couple of key projects of work we've been involved in. I'm sure you're all familiar a few years ago with um, Ebola. Uh, we were already working in Liberia, uh, providing care there before the Ebola outbreak. Um, and we have a strong commitment to Africa and its economy as part of our uh, long-term strategy. This is the, uh, the outfits that everybody had to wear. It would take you over 25 minutes to get dressed. Um, someone was watching you and helping you. You could only wear them for an hour at a time because you would lose up to a litre of fluid while you were wearing them. And so then after an hour, you had your time written on your arm so no, you, everybody knew. And then you would have to come out, undress, dispose of a lot of what you were wearing, rehydrate and start again. It was an incredibly dangerous environment. Um, we had three key projects for the Australian government, the UK government and the US government across two nations. At our peak, we were running seven Ebola hospitals, uh, 200 expats, 800 Africans. I should point out that Medicine Sans Frontier, who did an amazing job, um, had uh, 23 people infected with Ebola and 14 died. Uh, in our full time, we didn't have one single infection. And to give you an idea how big the facilities were, this is one facility, one hospital. And we provided all of those services. So you can see it's not just a ward or whatever, it's everything, the accommodation, the catering, the stores, the logistics, every single thing that is part of the solution. We believe in legacy in everything we do. Um, so we didn't rely on government or INGO grants to support work we did after we left Africa. We continued to expand our footprint in Africa at our own cost. We now have clinics in uh, Sierra Leone, Southern Sudan, Libya, and we found out yesterday we've just been selected by the UN to take over their hospital in Somalia. Uh, we've developed models that we think are really critical because we don't just look after the expatriate workers. We make sure we have models that look after local workers as well. And that allows us to deliver our uh, care to the communities at large. And we've introduced the only aeromedical medical evacuation service that's operating in uh, the whole of Northwest Africa and we're about to do the same into Libya talk a little bit about what we're doing in Iraq. Um, everybody would have seen uh, the war in Mosul and what it's meant uh, and the war with IS. Uh, we set up two hospitals um, initially uh, down in Abthar and Haman al-Alil. I'll just point out how challenging this was. The WHO, the World Health Organization, built these hospitals. They went to every single member nation in the world, 193 nations, and not one of them would staff the hospitals. They went to all of the NGOs like MSF, Save the Children, Samaritan's Purse, and all of them said either A, we are absolutely busy already, we're in Yemen, we're in Iraq, we're in Libya, we're in Syria, or this is so close to the front line, literally the mortar rounds from IS were literally like just across the street, um, and you need security and we won't go into a facility that requires security. Four weeks after we were asked, we opened the first hospital, three weeks later the second, um, we've just been extended today out till January for the hospital in uh, number two. We've opened number three and we're now discussing hospitals four and five. Um, so we've made sure we've recruited Iraqi staff. We've handed over hospitals number one, the trauma and maternity hospitals, um, and those are now open and, and running uh, with Iraqi staff. So we're contributing to the rebuild of the uh, health system in Iraq. Um, as you can see there, the dates that we've continued to open other facilities. Our statistics, uh, as at the 3rd of November, um, almost 13,000 patients and we've helped deliver over 1,400 babies. Um, this was our very first patient and the reason that this is a, a lovely photo is um, the woman carrying the baby is a, uh, a Sunni, uh, she's a, uh, um, and an Arab. Uh, the guy uh, carrying the drip, uh, helping her leave with the baby, uh, is a Kurd. Uh, and so to bring so many of these people together to be able to deliver care is, is it's a wonderful thing. Um, and the, the, uh, the trauma patients we've seen are, are just enormous. Our legacy here, um, very, very strong uh, entities now in Iraq and Kurdistan, strong base for growth. It's been important to co-design the facilities with people um, and we've handed, as I said, over the first hospital contributed to local capacity development and really created efficiencies by using locals that have allowed us to grow the capability and help them get back on their feet. Um, 
the reason we're all here is because we're interested in being a B Corp. Um, I was saying uh, in uh, the pre-session, um, filling in those forms is really challenging. There's no two ways about it. But you're better off to start when you're small as a company than big. Trust me, by the time you get in 14 countries and 2,000 people, it is a lot of effort. It's worthwhile. But I would say the sooner you start, the better. So what did being a B Corp and the impacts mean to us? Well, we confirmed that all of our staff contracts, no matter where we are in the world, no matter who we're working with, uh, all meet legislative and ethical standards. Uh, we've seen a dramatic reduction in staff turnover due to our philanthropic in, uh, endeavours, which are really, really well regarded by the staff. The B Corp give absolute clarity to what you're doing. And then we find that staff act as ambassadors for us for recruitment of future staff as well. Um, I've just included this is just a, a, we put this out as an infographic we do uh, on, on what being a B Corp has mean to us and we distribute this around. But I'll point out that all of those savings, because the staff drive the B Corp, it's not driven by me, it's not driven by our CEO, it's driven by the staff. They wanted to focus on sustainability and to be able to drive down air travel by 43%, electricity consumption by 77% is not just <coughs> contributing to the community, but it's saving us as well and allows us to reinvest our funds. So for us, it's been this is an important way as a one single graphic to show our staff and show our customers what's important. For marketing, knowledge of B Corp is still very limited in the broader business community. You have got to have some B Corp marketing material and B Labs will help you with that. I was giving a brief to the World Health Organization and uh, our foreign affairs and trade. There's about a three and a half minute video which is very good. I got some one page documents and some more detailed documents which I've handed out. And everybody goes, this is great. This is really helpful, but there does need to be more systemic marketing. And I was chatting just before this, all of B Corps need to do that. And, and so, you know, I've now just got a standard email I send out to everybody for them to get across it. And the video is very powerful. Um, once customers understand what a B Corp is, and a lot of them don't, they really appreciate it. We've got to continue to educate our customers on the benefits of uh, B Corp certified companies and using them and giving preference to B Corps. Um, and so we need to work with them to get them excited around that idea of B Corps, give them a level of surety about who we are. So briefly, what being a B Corp mean to us does represent that we're part of that emerging group of companies that are using the power of business to make a positive impact. Uh, we're redefining success in business by not being the best in the world, but the best for the world. Uh, and B Labs are a not-for-profit, and that's been a really critical thing that we've been able to push with people, that, that that B Labs are a not-for-profit themselves, so they're giving that sign-off. Uh, the line I always use is, we can make a difference and make a profit. We can be good for shareholders and good for the society at the same time. BD, having business development, having a social purpose is a very strong and positive message as part of our business development. We work very closely with marketing to ensure that potential customers understand the benefit of external and internal audits, and there needs to be a better understanding of which companies grant preference to B Corps as certified providers. Westpac is one of the biggest banks in Australia. They provide B Corp uh, preference, but it's not on any of their procurement documentation and you need to go to them and say, by the way, are you aware you do this? Now you need to show that. And a lot of them in the procurement areas aren't, so we need to continue to educate them. Finally, in uh, finance, B Corp certification ensures that all of our practicals are ethical and transparent. Uh, only this morning I was having a telephone call. We um, use very closely uh, meeting things like making sure we provide full exposure around transparency and spend. Uh, we meet all of the anti-slavery requirements of, uh, of what B Corps are and that are needed in the UK. Australia, for example, doesn't require that, but we provide it as part of our documentation. It fits in with our B Corp certification. And as I've said, really, as you saw, very significant positive impacts on cost and overhead, which are driven by staff and their area of interest. I think this is the thing that's different between corporate social responsibility and B Corp. CSR is driven from the top down. Uh, B Corp is driven from every single person within the organisation. What it means is it just ends up being part of your DNA and part of the way of doing business and allows you to drive those savings that you get to invest back into the social purpose you have. Thank you very, very much um, uh, for the time today. I'll be happy to take questions during the Q&A session or any questions after the business. Thank you.
Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Clean. So you can see that uh, before that, when we're talking about the social enterprises, especially those business organizations will think that, I think that, okay, social enterprises is a small or even micro enterprises, even though they have a great ideas, but the impact is not so great. So that most of the businessmen will just put their focus still on the value creation on the money terms. And then finally, they will donate the money as a CSR activity. So you can see that from SB Medical, even a big organization, when they adopt the big corporation, so the sales increase, and also they are do good for our society and also their staff as well as their customers. So uh, now, maybe we turn from Australia to the Korea. Okay, Mr. Kim. So basically, Mr. Kim is the CEO of Merry Year, not Merry Christmas, because Merry Christmas is coming. But it's quite interesting that uh, his company name called the Merry Year Social Company. So basically, he's a award-winning Korean company and also a social innovator, social incubator, and also a social investor. So, but finally, he also adopted the B Corporation in his company. So maybe it's time for us to share from Mr. Kim to see how a B Corporation can also be implemented in a social incubator or social in impact investment company. Mr. Kim, please. Good morning. My name is Jung Tae Kim. I'm a social innovator, social entrepreneur, and change maker based in Seoul. And I'm happy to share our stories and also big corp stories in Korea and some lessons learned throughout the, the journey. So big corp in action in Korea. So we are it's like a 19 change maker company, and our average age is 30. So it's a quite young organization. And this is our manifesto about who we are. We think we are entrepreneurs. You know entrepreneurs, right? Entrepreneurs and change makers working inside specific organizations like corporations and public institutions. So we think we are entrepreneurs empowering social entrepreneurs and change makers outside working together toward the, the best for the world. So this is our manifesto which was strengthened further by the time we got uh, certified as a B Corp. So B Corp is a powerful vehicle to show who we are and where actually we are going. So I'm really happy to be part of this uh, B Corp community in Asia versus around the world. And this is our office. So some keywords that we love is entrepreneurship, design thinking, collective impact, open innovation, lean startup. So these all the uh, innovation related you know, words and keywords, these are what actually we deal with every day. And about a month ago, our president actually came to the building where we are, and there are over 50 social ventures, more than 500 young change makers are actually working inside this building. And the president paid a visit to this building and organized a meeting and then announced a social economy policy, a series of social economy policies. And I think this was kind of the tipping point where the government and the society, the public at large, they start recognizing, okay, there's something about really important thing going on together with social ventures and social innovations. And that was uh, truly a tipping point, I would say. So my company was founded in 2011 as a social innovation consultancy and impact investor. Uh, opinion leaders from the financial and banking sectors, they get together to set up a company called Merry Year Social Company. So you are uh, you know, reminded of like a Merry Christmas. So every day, you know, every year, we strive towards something better and better. And we believe social issues or social problems can be a really great source of innovation. Innovation that is much actually uh, you know, welcomed by corporations and the government around the world. And if our belief is if we can start viewing social issues as a source of innovation, then many social problems can be actually uh, solved together with all the uh, cross-sector players. So some numbers, our impact. So we've been incubating over 500 social ventures so far. Social ventures on many issues. So Korea, we have so many other issues, right? And then. Uh, 
since we learned a lot from these social business models, we are now applying and replicating the models across uh, Asia as well, including Vietnam, Indonesia, and Uganda and Nepal. And then I'm honored to uh, say that we're also one of the honorees for the best for the world, especially in terms of the workers this year. And if you can take a look at our scores, especially we are very strong at the workers, and our employees, our change makers are really happy to be working together every day. And we call it ourselves innovation design and system design company. So whoever wants to start innovation, could it be government, could it be multinational companies, could it be United Nations, could it be NGO civil society, we are there to serve as a companion to their innovation journey or facilitator to their innovation culture and or designing their own innovation experience. So uh, depending on the level where, you, where they are, depending on uh, the issues, we actually provide customized innovation experience and design as well. So some highlights that we've been doing so far. So we launched the first SIB, Social Impact Bonds in Asia, and we co-founded the first SIB intermediary called Pan Impact Korea. Also, we put our own money into this scheme for uh, borderline intellectual functioning children for one, around 100. And this is a mechanism where not only government, but also private sector companies, but also investors, they joined forces to drive a innovation in tackling a specific issues that we actually are uh, dealing with every day. The second one is collective impact. We've been investing in specific companies and ventures, but we couldn't see progress you know, year by year. So we changed our approach from investing in one specific companies, but we start investing in the system. The system where not only social ventures, but also related public institutions, the other stakeholders gather together to come up with the really powerful business models to address those issues. And we started a collective impact model on the people, for, uh, people with autism. And this is the first company that we actually impact invested. Uh, five years ago, and we gained around 20% of share. And this company luckily became the number one um, you know, company in terms of share house models. So in this way, we are interested in scaling up the innovative ideas and solutions across the nation so that more issues can be solved, hopefully. And this is our theory of change for social innovation. We believe these three approaches are needed, essentially. First of all, we think individuals, they need to be change makers inside organizations. Without them, without the change makers inside organizations, any project, any businesses, you know, any actions could not be sustained. So we focus on how to grow change makers inside so that change making or innovation could be further uh, sustainable. The second one is, in terms of cooperation level. How to make the vehicle more transparent, efficient, and powerful. And we believe B Corp is such a powerful vehicle for corporations to become. So that's our second theory of change. And after that, as I mentioned, we believe collective impact should be more uh, tried out. Because one company or one organization cannot make a difference in those issues. Issues are so complex, issues are so complexity, so that without this kind of collective impact, we don't have a chance to, you know, having these issues solved. And regarding the big cops in Korea, we have uh, 10 big cops, and luckily, saying we are not actually the first big cop, we are the ninth big cop and we are taking on the responsibility to make the e movement in a wide, as wide as possible. And there are two well-known big groups in Korea. One is Soka. And Soka, this became the number one company in car sharing market. And their recent, uh, their revenue last year was 900 million US dollars. So it's a quite a big company. <clears throat> and last year they got the investment from SK Group, which is a you know, big company over 30 million US dollars. So B Corp in Korea is now big in, becoming bigger and bigger with these companies. 
developing. And we have a, another one called General Bio. And this is likely to be the first public company, perhaps by the end of this year or early next year. And their valuation is expected to be around 200 million US dollars. So with this you know, happening, then our Bitcoin movement could be you know, gaining uh, more momentum, I think. And <clears throat> because we are so satisfied with the Bitcoin and the beauty of the Bitcoin movement, we also decided to make it a movement outside of our, uh, our own company. So we are currently in the process of setting a BDAP South Korea and also translated the Bitcoin handbook into Korean as well. So also translated one version of one version of B impact assessment because English is a, 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 I think it's a quite a big barrier to Korean companies. So when they actually opened up the website, then I shut it up because of the English issues. So uh, we, we started translating one sample version of the you know, B impact assessment and with it, they are now looking at, okay, this is something that we can do. And we are currently serving as a BICO ambassador. We are moving into B uh, market builders as well. So uh, environment is changing in a positive manner for BICO movement in Korea. So the government is now starting considering some elements of B impact assessment as part of their own guidelines because they are now creating you know, funds of funds and their question is which company is eligible, qualified to get these public funds and to assess which company is eligible and qualified, they are now thinking, they are now talking with us to use, make use of some B impact assessment elements, which is you know, quite good. And COICA, this is like a USAID, it's an ODA agency, and they decided to make use of B impact assessment to screen which Korean companies they are also <coughs> eligible to get the, the grant or the fund. So this is another significant <coughs> sorry, progress that's been made. <coughs> and then it used to be like a small and medium companies movement so far like us, but in a bigger and bigger companies they are now looking at B impact assessment, they are now in the process of going through the B impact assessment. So we, we can see some big companies becoming big cops. And these are the benefits and changes, some benefits that can be uh, observed, especially by our juniors. You know, the CEOs talking about the company is not, maybe not the truth. So I believe the juniors, when they talk about the company, I think there's a truth about it. And there are some points, like uh, we increased the pay holidays starting 19 days. So that's where we start. And then we also uh, ONS raised. And you never know how it feels like when we got recognized by the people around the world, even though they don't have an idea about my company, but when they look at our logo, Biko, they recognize it, they welcome us. So it's a truly uh, amazing experience, I think. And lastly, these are the benefits, I think. I'd like to explain this into two um, areas. The one is internal branding. The second one is external branding. And especially this is true of our company, which is providing social innovation. When we provide, when we consult with big companies, and this is something that you need to do, this is the corporate culture changing that you need to do, then they may ask back us, so are you practicing this? Are you applying these kinds of all the guidelines, uh, innovation uh, methodologies that you're talking to me? So are you practicing this? Then we can say yes. Because in terms of the internal branding, we say as we leave out the values that we actually talking to the clients. And this is uh, such a powerful marketing message and the engine and everything I think that we can get out of the big cops. So uh, in terms of productivity, revenue, sustainability, and then HR retention, everything, is, uh, we've, been, we've been observing many good things happening out of the B Corp and B Impact Assessment uh, the movement. So I'm happy to have any inquiries and comments during the panel discussions. Thank you. OK, thank you, Mr. Kim. So you can see that uh, being a B Corp is not just only a certification. It's finally really beneficial to the organization, just like Mr. Kim's 
Mary Ears Company because they score very high in the workers level so that they leverage their competitive edges to use their, the power of their staff being a entrepreneurship, okay, not only to promote internally, but finally try to influence others company to do good in the marketplace, to do it in a collective way, so as to create a greater impact to the markets. So this is a new way to be a B Corp, okay? So next, uh, once again, we come back to the uh, medical services. But this round, we will uh, to hear from China, okay? Miss Ming Ko, okay. From first response, so what is your first response to her? Very right, young? <laughs> Pity? Yeah, right? Okay. So basically, Ms. Minko is the partner and international affair director of First Was Born in China. So let's give a pause to Ms. Minko, okay? How she can use minimal effort to create the greatest impact to the world. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Mr. Chung. Um, Hi everybody, my name is Minko. I'm currently a partner and international affairs director at First Respond. Um, for my presentation, I wanted to be more conversational. So um, instead of using a PPT slides for a formal presentation, I would like to actually um, introduce you and share our story about First Respond, who we are, um, what we do, and why we do what we do at the same time, why we actually went for the B Corp certification in 2016. So to give you a little bit introduction about First Respond, we are a leading Chinese social enterprise and the very first certified B Corp in mainland China, dedicated to delivering high quality first aid training and services and solutions to the clients coming both from the private and public sectors. We were first established back in 2010 by a group of China Europe International Business School graduates, both MBAs and EMBAs, including myself. Uh, but we didn't come into full operation until 2015 when we first completed our pre series investment. So in the very beginning, we were merely a very small group of people um, providing small group of first aid volunteers providing the services to various marathon events near around Shanghai. And it was not until 2011 that three of our founding members lost two of their classmates due to sudden cardiac arrest. And the very unfortunate incident about um, this two, two incident was that even though that they actually took places in the public places, one passed away in our school gym and the other one when he was participating in the Shenzhen Marathon. Um, even though there were people around them, they, were, they passed away even before the ambulances arrived at the scene. And since that incident, our founding members really started to spend a significant amount of their time trying to really figure out what was going on in China. And after spending a couple of years doing a research, we came to a conclusion that we have to start a business um, addressing these two, two key social challenges. First is the increased uh, rate of preventable death, such as sudden cardiac arrest, and second being the negligent absence of a social system um, to medical emergencies. So every year in China, there are approximately 560,000 people dying solely due to um, sudden cardiac arrest. As you may already aware of, sudden cardiac arrest is nothing, um, nothing it's, it's different from heart attack. And in other words, in less than every one minute, there is at least one person dying due to the same condition in the country. And the three main leading causes why this, keep, why this phenomenon keeps happening without getting any better can be categorized into three different areas. First, uh, because of the inefficient and ineffective 120 ambulance system in China, which is equivalent to 911 system back in the States. And second, um, and also as well as an absence of an AED law in China, which means that if you go to public places, including the shopping malls, um, libraries, uh, subways, and even the big largest railway stations in China, it's very difficult to find AEDs um, placed in those areas. And moving on, which um, that's the second reason, is because of an increased um, rate of cardiovascular disease in China due to environmental risk factors, including urbanization, 
um, pollution as well as aging population. And currently in China, the survival rates of out of hospital cardiac arrest is less than 1%. To be very specific, 0.2% in Beijing. And compared to that of other countries, including the states, as well as some of the advanced countries in Europe, it's very low. Um, it actually goes up to 20 to 40 percent, depending on the cities in the states, and up to 30 to 40 percent also in some of the advanced countries in Europe. And what makes the whole entire um, phenomenon worse is the low public act of kindness. I'm sure that a lot of you in the audiences are aware of the fact uh, that very unfortunately, Chinese people still suffer a very notorious reputation of not engaging themselves and unwilling to engage themselves in or of proposing uh, and offering help for those strangers in a, in a distressed situation. And the three main, re three main reasons why this is keep happening is because, putting the cultural uh, background aside, is first of all because less than 1% of the whole entire Chinese population has ever been trained with the very basic life supporting skills in their entire life. This, again, is extremely low compared to that of other um, countries. Again, um, comparing to the states, it goes up to 20 to 25%, and even up to 80 to 90% in countries including Germany, Sweden, and Norway. And because simply people don't know how to respond in this kind of situations, they, they lack confidence. And at the same time, what makes everything worse is that there was no legal protection for protecting these Good Samaritans. Very recently, and very fortunately, um, there has been a national level of Good Samaritan law that has been passed, and it came active starting from this October 1st. But whether this law actually motivates people to engage in such um, situations, such, such emergencies, well, still remains a question mark. So acknowledging all these issues together, we built up First Respond with an aim to empower all the people living in China to have the right skills and to the right knowledge to um, save a life so that no life is left unsaved when they can be saved with an eventual hope to create a mutual aid as a new social norm. And today we have three main, um, business three main divisions for the business operation. Uh, first is the training, which is the fundamental basis of our entire operation. Second part is the corporate solutions. We provide a service package to our corporate clients, which is inclusive of AD installations as well as the training, at the same time system building with our um, connectivity technology using your mobile, app, mobile app. And the last part is the event operations, uh, mainly focusing on marathon events. And this is also a service package inclusive of volunteers network, telecommunication system, and hardware and software all inclusive. And since 2015, 2015 until, until today, we've been able to use our business in order to train more than one million people with the very basic life supporting skills. And specifically speaking about uh, marathon events, we've been able to provide a service to ensure the sa operation, safety operation of events um, up to more than 253 covering 32 different cities nationwide, and most importantly, saving 11 lives suffering from sudden cardiac arrest with a 100% success rate. And coming back to the story of the B Corp, why, we, why, we, why on earth we even go for the B Corp certification in China? Um, we positioned ourselves as a social enterprise and a purpose-driven business from the very beginning. There was no doubt that we were going to change our values for, for, um, for profit. But during the process, when we were communicating with our clients and our potential investors, without having that notion or a clear idea of what social enterprise actually meant to them, uh, they associate us with, immediately with the nonprofits. So the market price that we are putting for our service packages at the same time for investors, we were not a very attractive investee. And during, because of that um, struggles that we had, we wanted to find some type of resources or a great um, communication tool to teach the Chinese market about what social enterprise is and to show them that it is possible to pursue a profit at the same time, drive your businesses for a purpose. And out of all the options that we had back in the days, B Corp was the most suitable one that we had because um, their philosophy was using business as a force for good 
And their uh, mission was to change the mindset of the traditional entrepreneurs so we can collectively redefine the success of a business. It was not an easy uh, process to go through the whole entire BIA coming from coming, operating and coming from China. But after spending two, um, two to three months to go over the whole entire BIA, we were able to get it um, in 2016, June. And ever since then, at our surprise, it actually created a lot of impact for our company um, from various different perspectives. So marketing and customer engagement and business development and no doubt for our employee engagement as well. But to highlight some of the um, immediate and imminent impacts that we, the B Corp actually had for our company, I'm going to give you a little bit of example of the marketing and customer engagement as well as the business development. As a startup with maybe 30 to 40 uh, full-time employees, it's very difficult to allocate a budget for marketing. And as soon as we got the B Corp certification, it was the media partners and the media um, companies that were actually chasing after us to write about our stories and what we were doing in terms of bringing these changes that we want to bring to our society. And through that, uh, it consequently led to having more conversation, opening more up doors to have an opportunity to attract um, potential investors as well as uh, potential clients. And clients meaning that a lot of uh, global MNCs, because we provide the services for the corporate clients, a lot of MNCs who actually um, were already aware of the B Corps wanted to hear about our story and wanted to partner with us if it were, they were not pursuing the services that we provided. And um, another example that I can also give you is that We've been able to do a very small sharing session at Oxford University of becoming the very first B Corp in mainland China. And through that opportunity, we were actually uh, referred, to, referred to attend one of the um, competitions for social entrepreneurship called the Shiva's The Venture Competition. And through that, we were also able to secure a very huge, um, a key client um, per in a regard as our very long-term partner and also at the same time the client. So to recap my um, presentation for today, being a B Corp actually does two major things immediately as soon as you become a certified B Corp. First, what it does is that it actually recognizes your ch achievement and at the second time it guides you to do better if you're not doing the best. So B Corp also gives you a very solid identity that you're part of the community that's building a new global movement uh, towards a new economy and a sense of security that you are not alone in change the mindset of the entrepreneurs and to redefine what it actually means to be um, a successful business. So I definitely highly recommend for any of you who actually has a startup or work for a company that are purpose driven, I definitely and highly recommend you to go through the BIA process and get certified and become part of the movement. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Mead. As uh, Jeff shared with us uh, this morning, China is a very, is really a big market. But even though that, some of the startups, some of the company nowadays trying to, okay, be a big cop, okay? So in Hong Kong, so the Education for Good and Social Entrepreneurship Forum is trying to promoting the big cop in Hong Kong. So later on, maybe we will introduce a bit about that. So if we can build a very good foundation on the B Lab or big corporation, maybe we can assist those people or those companies in China to foster the big cop movement in China as well. So uh, nowadays, we are talking about social housing. Even our chief executive, Carrie Nam, put this in her policy address. So, is it possible to do it in China? Okay, so next speaker will share with us how he can adopt some kind of the affordable housing in solving the housing problem in China, especially in Beijing. So next speaker is Mr. Zhang Feng. Uh, he is the principal architect and founding partner of People's architecture office and of course his company is also one of the big corporation in China okay mr. Zhang peace uh, 
非常抱歉，我可能只能用中文来向大家介绍我们的工作。呃，然后呢，我的介绍呢，我想分成两部分，就第一部分非常快，就想介绍一下我们公司是什么样的，让大家有一个很直接的感受。第二部分呢是比较重，就我想说一下我们在成为 B Corp 之后，我们公司发生了什么样的变化，呃，就为什么会发生这些变化，以及呃我们做了什么。呃，那么我就先从介绍我们自己公司开始。呃，这个就是我们公司所在的地方。呃，我们是在一个非常老、非常传统的社区，在北京的胡同里边。呃，如果大家在屋顶上看，我相信没有人能发现我们公司。<笑>呃，这个就是我们。呃，我们公司也非常小，只有二十人的一个团队。呃，然后呢，我们我应该是我们公司现在最老的员工，其实是。呃，然后我们呢，在成立的时候就非常希望我们的公司是一个，因为我们是一家设计公司，我们希望我们能够对。社会对环境能够有责任，所以我们在给自己公司做这种基础设施的时候，都选择了很多呃自己的想法。像我们的日常垃圾一定要做蚯蚓堆肥，我们的所有的污水都必须净化成中水，向呃市政排放。还有我们因为北京其实中国的空气污染问题很严重，所以这个新风是呃我们必须要考虑的。呃，然后同时我们的员工每天都享受着美味的食物。呃，各种各样的美食，就我们专门聘请了一位像那位戴帽子的大爷，他是我们的邻居，但他的手艺非常好，就他给我们带来了很好的生活。呃，同时，呃，我们每天的工作充满了各种各样的笑点，就大家都是以这个为乐子，其实是。还有，我们定期的讲座，这一期讲座其实就是在讲塑料怎么污染环境，其实是。OK， 呃，那进入到下面一块其实我想讲的是，我们首先是一家设计公司，我们是做设计，呃，但是我们的想法呢，是我们去寻找社会问题，做设计，呃，然后把这个设计能够产品化，再反过来影响社会，这个是我们给自己构建的一个路径，呃，那么在成为 B Corp 之后呢，我想呃给大家看一下我们呃怎么做出了一些真正的工作。这个是我们在成为 B Corp 之前做的各种各样的工作，就大家能看见很多类型的设计，从建筑设计、呃、室内设计、展览设计到甚至产品设计，呃，中间每一个项目我都能很清楚地说明我们是怎么考虑对社会带来好处的，呃，但是这种模式其实我们的兴趣在于发现新的社会问题，然后给它设计，这个是我们的。优势也是我们的兴趣所在，可是呃，成为了 B Corp 之后呢，我们不能再像以前那样做工作。原因是呃，我自己的认为 ，B Corp 最大的一个特点是要把这种观念影响到更多人。呃，但是我们原来的做法呢，其实是我们的乐趣很大，就我们不停地去找好玩的社会问题，然后去做设计。可是它没有办法持续的影响，或者说它没有产生足够的深度。呃，所以在成为 B Corp 之后呢，我们给自己的业务类型做了四个定性，就是我们必须做这四个类型的建筑设计，呃，设计工作。它包括呃，我们管它叫 Plug-in House， 其实是一个塑预制的、很快搭建的房屋系统，呃，建筑设计，还有开放的办公环境和活动装置。但是在一年的这个工作当中，我们是一七年拿到 B Corp 的。这一年下来呢，我们对这四个类型做了一些调整。呃，大家可以看见，就第一个插件加房屋，我们把它定型为一个产品。呃，第二个从巨大的建筑，我们把它定型到一个预制的建筑。呃，第三个是从开放的办公环境，我们转换成一个健康的办公环境。最后一个没有变化，还是活动装置。呃，我来先一个一个来介绍一下，就为什么会发生这种变化。呃，首先先说一下插件家和内核医院。插件家和内核医院的故事呢，其实是从一三年开始的。呃，因为呃，就老的城市里边有很多传统社区，这种社区在中国的命运大部分都是被拆除，呃，来更新。
，所以我们对这个有自己的想法。我们的想法是不用去拆除那些老房子，我们直接在老房子里塞一个预制好的新房子，就能够提供很好的空间环境，它能够让呃传统社区得以保留，呃，让人际关系也得以保留。呃，这个就是我们的一个想法。呃，它有一系列的好处，比如说它很快。它不需要很专业的人，它不需要很专业的工具，呃，以及它的造价是非常呃适合普通居民购买的，呃，还有它的节能的一些特性，呃，都有各种各样的好处。呃，这个是我们第一次做的时候，我和我的合伙人 James 自己来做这个房屋测试。嗯、呃，对，这个是现场的一些情况。呃，它都是在工厂做好，所以在现场呢，我们只需要拿这个钩子来把板材连接起来，就可以完成很多工作。所以老的房子完全不用去动。呃，同时因为新的板材的特性呢，就它能够让室内空间的质量变得很好，呃，同时也很快。呃，我们在北京的胡同区里边，现在做了二十多个这种房子。呃，其实这个产品也在不停的进化。呃，管线都是到现场直接穿线就可以了。对，很快这样一个房子就能完成。呃，然后我们还给它配了这个堆肥马桶和净化槽。呃，我这次新加了一张图片，是堆肥马桶呃产出的东西。呃，其实就是花肥，非常环保。呃，这是我们完成的一些图片，有它有民宿，有办公，呃，有会议室。就下面这些点呢，都是我们呃已经完成的项目，就在这个北京故宫的南边。呃，然后呢，呃，这个事情到了一五年呢，就有两个居民来向我们采购。呃，这是小凡。呃，我们给他还是用同样的系统搭了一个很小的房子，给他带来了很好的光照和很好的室内环境。他现在已经生了宝宝。然后这位是赵大爷，他同样的他是老人，呃，但他同样是用这个方法获得了一个在冬季也能够呃居住的室内空间。这四位就是我们呃内科院的项目，就目前已经彻底完成的四户居民。呃，然后我来说一下，就 B c o p 之后我们做了什么？我们把它产品化，呃，我们给它做了四种类型的房屋产品，呃，分别有不同的面积和室内空间，呃，同时呢，我们去呃完善了这个产品的各种测试，呃，它的力学、它的燃烧和它的污染物，呃，现在还在做新的测试，就这些测试是一系列的。呃，这个呢是我们当时做燃烧失败的一次，因为成功的一次大家什么都看不出来，所以我拿了一次失败的视频给大家看。呃，这个非常难做，其实我们花了一年多的时间来做。然后呢，这两户呢就是这个新的用户。呃，我在这儿想说一下为什么它发生了这个变化，是因为呃，中国现在有大量的人口从城市回到农村。呃，但是在农村的建造方式还是用砖，还是用最传统的方式在建造。呃，这个有很多问题。第一个是呃，这个环境对环境不友好，因为它用的是粘土砖。第二个呢是它产生大量的这个现场污染。呃，第三个呢其实是它的质量是控制不好的。所以现在我们还是相当于在工厂做好所有的事情，到乡村去做这个事情。呃，这个是。居民自己来采购，这个不是中国政府推动的预制化建筑，而是中国呃最普通的人能够购买的这种预制化房屋。呃，同时呢，我们还在深圳做这种老房子的呃，就内核院的工作。呃，这个都是在深圳的城中村里边。呃，这个也是，这个是一个呃客家的老宅的内部改造。也是做成呃工作坊啊，还有这种呃 Airbnb 的住宿，呃对，所以上面那个呢，其实是呃后面说的这几个事情都是在今年年底、明年年初会完成，所以呃我们相当于是把内核院的事情彻底产品化，然后让最普通的人能够获得各种各样的证书，放心的去购买。然后第二个大块呢，是从建筑到预制建筑。
呃，建筑项目其实对我们来说，这个是非常好的项目，非常呃，六十万平米，大概一万多人居住在这里边，都是我们来设计。我们的工作就是来调它的形状，目的呢是为了让呃更多的这个小区的人能够享受到呃阳光和旁边这个景观，呃，同时呢，开发商不会抬高价格，同时呢，呃，市场能够接受它，这个是我们原来的工作。呃，但是在成为了 B Corp 之后呢，我们调了一下我们的工作方向，呃，是因为呃，中国现在有太多的这种地产项目都是在很浪费的工作的，就是它的那个建造方式是非常浪费。我们想提这个预制化的建筑，呃，就也同样是很多东西都在工厂做好，呃，同样呢是质量能够在工厂保证好，而不用去现场做更多的工作。呃，这个是我们最初的一个构想，就是结构还有它的墙的系统、屋顶的系统。是如何在工厂被拆解和制作的，以及这个系统是多么的灵活，它能够自己去生长，去适应各种各样的环境，呃，适应各种各样的使用要求。呃，这个是我们最初的一张想象，就是在呃乡村或者是很不适合盖房子的地方，呃，我们无需去对这个当地的环境做更多的呃干扰。直接在那儿放一个房子，他们就可以呃居住在上面，下面还可以接着呃农业生产也可以，呃保留原有的这个地址地貌也可以。呃，所以这个事情在今年呢，我们在烟台先试了一下，呃，这个呢是烟台的老城区，就大家看见这些都是殖民时期的房屋，但是因为城市化的进程呢，它现在被弄到一个边边上了，就呃同时它的空间呢是被大量的会所、餐厅。呃，租用了，所以这个区域现在一般人是进不来的，它是高档消费区。呃，我们呢，在这个停车场用了三个月的时间，快速形成了一个房屋，呃，来测试一下这个区域能不能够做一些改变。为什么说是测试？呃，我想用这个来说一下，它里边有什么。在高的这边呢，呃，这边呢其实是有一个活动大厅，呃，咖啡馆，呃，阅读阅览室，电影放映间。呃，所有的功能呢，目的都是一个，是为了把在这个空间里边发生的跟保护、跟对社会有好处的事情，呃，能够向大众来扩散。呃，同时呢，这个业主呢，其实也就是这个区域的新的租用者呢，想在这里边搞各种各样的活动来，呃，怎么讲，就是来测试这个区域能不能以后发展成对文化、对社会更有好处的呃地区，而不仅仅是一个餐馆集中地、一个会所集中地。但他没有把握，所以他投入了一百万先试一下。这个房子呃很快可能会被拆掉，但是他的任务能够完成以后就可以很轻松的拆。呃，这是建造的过程，其实是我们从进入开始想，一直到完成就三个月时间，非常快。呃，然后这个事情之后呢，其实在，在呃北京的中关村也要出现一个这样的房屋。呃，在内蒙古的通辽也要出现这一个这样一个房屋，他们两个的有一个很大的优势，都是对原有地面不破坏。像这个房子，它下面是一个车道，它的用地很紧张，呃，但它还是希望有一个很好的办公场所，能够呃在这个地方来出现。所以那呃，其实这种预制化的还有架空的方式，就是能够体现这种优势。呃，更有胜呢，这个是在雄安，是在九星的首都的区域的。会出现一个在农田上的社区，呃，这个是我们就我这次从香港回到北京就要去这边去讨论，因为它下面有拆迁的村庄，呃，我们也希望不要拆迁它，直接就保留，上面呢能够出现很好的房屋，而且在盖的过程中，其实这些工人也是直接居住在这儿的，呃，所以第二个部分建筑也是呃我们做了一些工作，第三个呢是关于办公的室内环境。呃，我们从开放转换到了健康。呃，开放呢，我想用我们给小猪短租，也就是山寨版的 Airbnb 他们的这个办公室来讲。呃，他们说到底呢，山寨他们还是在山寨家庭空间的共享出租，所以呢，我们给他的办公室是把他的家的空间，就是左边那个三室一厅的房屋，直接切成这么六块，扔到他的办公室里边去。这样带来的好处呢，就是呃，他很快的获得了家庭空间
办公化和办公空间啊、呃、家庭化这样一个状态。呃，同时也就更支持这种非常呃家庭化、比较放松的状态的工作模式，呃，我们管它就是叫做开放，呃，能够引导出更多的交流和更具有创新性的这种工作的环境吧。呃，那从开放到健康呢，我们把它转换成，就是我们在现在在帮乐平做这个办公室，呃，但是。就我们后来意识到，仅仅是开放是不够的，就是因为在中国其实是全世界的问题。就大家办公室，你的姿势啊、呃，可能八个小时、九个小时都是坐的，非常不健康。然后你的空气呢也是很不健康的，还有你的这个工作的各种细节，呃，都有问题。所以我们就想通过这个方这个乐平办公室的项目呢，来讨论一下，呃，怎么样工作是最健康和最有好处的。所以。呃，我们提了这样一个想法，就是有没有可能你的工作有三十分钟的时候是趴着工作的，有五个小时是坐着，呃，有两个小时你是站着的，甚至还有三十分钟你是爬在某个地方去工作，就是让你的身体不停地移动，这个是非常关键的。所以我们给他做了一个步行通道，就是你可以爬在那儿工作打电话，你可以跟人聊天就走路呃来开会，然后你还可以消耗你的卡路里。以及健身设施，呃，这个是一些呃当时构想的图。就左边那个其实是，我们给为它设计了一座山，就是你可以在那儿各种各样的姿势来工作。呃，然后它中间有一个非常大的空间，嗯，这个是现在还没有盖完，就还没有完全完成，但是有一些有一些现场图，就是上面那个红的，我们是希望都换成蔬菜，就是你自己自己吃的都是自己来种。呃，然后中间这个区域呢，就是希望以后能够搞各种各样的活动，像今天这样的论坛也可以在那儿去做。呃，对，所以这个是我们呃办公那边完成的事情。最后一个是活动装置，活动装置其实并没有发生太多的变化。这个是我们在呃成为 B Corp 之前做的项目，是我们管它叫可以移动的公共空间。是因为呃城市里边缺乏公共空间，这个在呃大陆的城市更是这样，呃所以呢我们希望能有一些呃不违法但是却非常灵活的方式能够出现这样的场所，呃这个一开始呢是为英国来设计的 Preston， 呃所以非常快速的骑到你要搞活动的地方打开，然后呢搞完活动呢再收缩呃，就可以移回到储藏的地方，呃它现在呢其实已经。呃，对，这是当时的照片。他现在已经在呃，比利时的鲁汶、英国 Preston、香港、呃，深圳，现在还有烟台和北京，已经都呃有人采购这个产品。呃，所以这个其实是我们觉得就很能代表我们设计怎么改变社会的一个想法的产品。呃，在烟台我们还是用了它，而且烟台用的。非常，我想提出来一点是，我们把这种做社活动的工具和建筑完全整合在一起。刚才有一点我没有说，这个建筑里边所有跟当地社区有关系的活动，将会被这些能够移动的工具骑到老社区里边去，移动到老社区里边去，去和呃不愿意到这儿来的人发生更紧密的联系，促进更多的交流。呃，这个也是这些产品的目的。呃，这是呃一个论坛，其实是大家可以看见还有舞狮在里边。呃，然后我们还为它设计了能够骑行的车，是信息亭、书报亭和售卖亭。对，这些车是可以骑出去的，然后能够骑到，嗯，有一些现场的活动。就这一块其实我们没有做太多调整，是因为这块的目的很清楚。我们以后还是会这么做。这是他搞完活动回来的时候。对，然后呃，在结束之前，我想最后说一句，就是。呃，我自己觉得 B c o p 对我们来说呢，嗯，它是逼迫我们把我们的想法类型化了
呃，但是这个类型化的目的呢，是为了它能够有深度的去进行一些工作，然后更方便的让别人能够了解。呃，但是说到底，我们是设计师，呃，我们的想法呢是用设计来让这个社会呃更美好。所以呢，就像刚刚大家看到的，促进更多人交流，呃，促进更多人健康。然后让这个社会啊、呃，比如说他对土地的依赖更少，就跟政治有关系。这些我们都是觉得设计是能够进入并且产生影响的。呃，所以说到底 ，B Corp 就是逼我们做出了一个选择。然后呢，我们做出这个选择之后呢，有可能在未来的两到三年都是在这四个类型下去工作。呃，这个应该是我自己觉得 B Corp 对我们的最大的一个影响。谢谢大家。Okay, thank you, Mr. Zhang. So, Mr. Zhang not only sharing about affordable housing, actually, he is demonstrating the design thinking process. It is also advocated by our CE in her recent policy address. So, basically, a lot of the uh, nowadays social problem, uh, actually, we need to find some way to identify the roots of the problem and use innovation to create some of the creative solution in order to solve the social problems. I think it is good for us to think about. Social housing is good for us, but if we can use, because in Hong Kong we have plenty of land in it, if we can establish some kind of the innovative construction, will it be better to use some kind of subdivided fat to solve the housing problem itself only? Because even though we have the subdivided fat in solving the housing problem, we can now okay, provide a happier environment for our people to live with. So maybe later on you will have a lot of the question to ask our speakers today. You can see that our speakers today, not only they are the big corporation, actually they are the change maker in their own business. And also they have came from big company, new startup, innovative company from a very wide spectrum. So I think it's the time for us to have the Q&A section. May I introduce four of the speakers to come on stage and so that we can have a more interactive interval. Yeah. So thank you very much. Okay, uh, because I'm the facilitator, I think I have the privilege to ask some questions first. And of course, later on, I will give enough time for the floor to ask your questions. So, uh, may I know why, okay, you adopt to be a B Corp? Because according to your sharing, I can't find why, the reason why. I know how, but why? Can you uh, maybe each of you share one or two sentences in this? Mr. Mr. Killian first. Um, for us, uh, the B Corp is a natural next step for us in our journey. Uh, we've always had social purpose at our core since we started the business and I was the very first employee. And we've always done stuff uh, that we believe gives back to society. We, we think we're very privileged and very lucky for the opportunities we've had. But um, uh, social purpose is evolving. And, and this, this group of people and the way that it is being presented through their businesses shows that it is evolving and developing. And so for us, it was the next natural step of bringing together all of the activities we do, be they philanthropic, be they for our staff, be they for our foundation, uh, or be they corporate social responsibility under a single unifying banner. Okay. So it means that, okay, uh, as we medical, when you start to be a B Corp, at that moment, the as being medical is not, I uh, was not facing any uh, maybe crisis, or you want to be a better because of your sales turnover job, or your satisfaction of your staff, or your customer uh, decrease? Uh, no, no, in actual fact, look, we, one of the only thing that we might face is as the co company gets bigger, yeah. uh, it is hard to communicate a personal vision yeah. across 2,000 people in 14 countries. Yeah. Uh, so B Corp gives us a, a universal language yeah. that everybody understands, no matter whether they're mm. in 
China or the Middle East or the US or the UK or Australia or the Pacific. Uh, it allows all of our people to have that common language around what's critical to us in our core. Yeah. That's very good. You can see that. Okay, BCOP, okay, maybe it's a universal tool for right. us to implement some of the business thoughts or business strategy from a top-down level so as to uh, improve the uh, communication within our company. So how about Mr. Kim? Yeah, I think uh, what Glenn said just echoes me, echoes our company as well. So just one word to describe fully who we are, I think that's the big goal because we've been sick and tired of explaining who we are you know, to our clients and partners. They actually, when they open up our um, annual report and everything, they, they you know, kept asking you know, who you are, why you are doing this, is it okay making a profit out of doing these things? And you know, being B Corp saved a lot of time and energy yeah. for us to explain, introduce who we are. And we say B Corp and that's it. So I think that's a universal language and that's the vehicle where we can put all the elements, the food, you know, elegant food inside. And that's how the clients and partners, they recognize it. Okay. Not in the food, but the vehicle okay. together. So that means B Corp also provide a very good branding yeah. to your company. Exactly. So that is one of the important uh, factors that we need to think about. Okay, in order to save time to explain our company to the uh, external just people. Just one word, uh, two words, just B -Cop. Say, I am B Cop. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy. So, how about Mr. Zhang? Actually, I'm very similar to my experience with the situation. Because when we were not B Cop, we would explain our clients to 呃，解释我们的环境理想的时候，非常非常的困难。就他们会觉得我们简直是傻子，或者是觉得就根本觉得你你就是不要钱的。就呃，后来我们就觉得我们来申请 B Corp， 我们来通过这所有的考试拿到这个 B Corp 之后，我们也不用那么费劲了。我们就说我们是 B Corp 就行了。对，但是后来又发生了另外一个情况，大家说你是 B Corp， 你干嘛要挣钱呢？<笑>这个也是现在让我们很困惑的一点，因为其实，在国内就很多人对 B Corp 的理解会等同于啊、呃，就是非盈利企业，所以呃，我们去做商业的事情的时候，他们会觉得你是一个 B Corp， 你干嘛还要收钱？就这个也是一个很有意思的地方，对。So two points I take it. Okay, firstly, I always ask by my friends that, are you fool? Why you do business in this way? <laughs> Same as you. Second point is that, again, need to save a lot of energy to explain to the external people. Yeah. How about Miss Me? Right. So first respond. Um, from uh, as I have mentioned during my my presentation, it was more of the same reason. Because a lot of our clients, especially and our, our investors, were denying us denying us to even have a conversation with them because they perceived as a nonprofit, and of course the price was a problem for them as well because Red Cross in in, in China were actually providing the same services for free, for free for the clients. Um, so in that sense, we had to we felt that there there's definitely an urge of um, changing how not only the businesses, but the people who are actually playing a key role within the whole entire value chain of the businesses, that's in including the investors as well as the consumers and also the business practitioners. <coughs> and besides that, another reason why we went for the B Corp was um, from my personal expectation was to use the B Corp to call for action and to find those people who are already doing something um, by driving their business for a purpose, but they didn't realize that they were either social enterprise or a purpose-driven um, business, but wanted to come out there and say, you know what, this is a great idea and I want to join the movement, what do I do now? So I wanted to have that um, happening in China. Okay, so in another angle about B Corp, it's just like a mirror, okay? To see who, is do who are doing in the marketplace, and how can we do better? And we can benchmark some of the good things in the marketplace. I think it's good for Alicia. You see, you can put this all comment on your FAQ in B Lab <laughs> or B Lab uh, website. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. So, uh, come back to a uh, very uh, you know substantial question. You're talking about profit. After you become a big cop, 
any effect on your profitability. Yep. Uh, well, as you saw from the graph we presented, our, our profitability has actually increased. Um, and it's increased because people focus on the things that are important, like uh, cost, sustainability and environment. They also see that because of the work that we do, the philanthropy we provide, the support we provide to other groups, the programs we run, they're actually motivated to, to do that because they know that if there is more money in the company, there's more uh, opportunity for programs to be delivered. Um, and then staff present with those programs. So uh, it's, it's a virtuous circle. So how about that thing, Mr. King? I think two things. Um, Korean government, they tend to not to like working with private companies, uh, thinking that working with them is, is going to be against like a public values. But once we got certified, you know, those challenges I think is diminishing, is decreasing because we are for profit company, but we actually aim for you know uh, values together with um, sustainable business model. So that because of these you know, changes, I think we, we are getting more like uh, new business opportunities with uh, the public institutions, central government, and 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 etc. So in terms of the uh, profit making opportunities, I think it's just, uh, actually increasing a lot. Because of the support of the government, exactly. once they think that a big corporation is also one of the yardstick to evaluate the effectiveness yeah. of the company. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Chang. Uh, 我们公司的这个市场的客户类型呢，有几种。我可以一条一条的过一下。第一个呢，政府呃没有任何变化，就B <笑> 第二个呢是这种NGO组织啊或者是非营利企业 来找我们的人被选择了，就他是认同我们的观念，知道我们要干什么啊，所以才来寻找我们的。就这个呃，坦白来讲，它的成功率和它也是我们希望做的事情。就这个其的确是对公司带来了很多的好处，而且呃，这
the problems in society are so complex and so wicked. We all need to help. It's not just governments, it's not just non not for profits, uh, it's not just community, but corporations, particularly innovative businesses, have a lot to add. But how do you discern between businesses that want to help and have a social purpose and those businesses that are only driven by profit regardless? B Corp gives you that banner. And, and so because it's an external audit and certification process, it's not just me saying, trust me, I'm good. It's somebody else coming in and saying, for us, a two year process to get our B Corp certification. Uh, and that shows we're committed, but it also shows that it's of value independently. And so we are starting to see the humanitarian sector open and it is really disruptive to the sector and that is what B Corp is now doing. It's allowing a disruption uh, to bring the best of what exists in all of our uh, businesses to some of those wicked social issues. Yeah, absolutely, I agree. Okay, so may I now okay, open the time to the floor. So, please. Uh, thank you for the very inspiring sharings. I really learned a lot. Yeah, uh, I have the two questions, and uh, mostly about trigger. Yeah, one for uh, Glenn and uh, another for Zhang Feng. Yeah, uh, for Glenn, uh, you mentioned about uh, after becoming a B Corp, uh, a lot of changes are driven by your staff. I'm wondering how you make that happen. Yeah, um, how you uh, make B Corp becoming your DNA? I know, I, I think basically uh, Aspen Medical is uh, like a natural B, but uh, how do you incorporate uh, B Corp spirit more um, embedded into your corporation? And maybe I finish questions yeah, all the okay, case. Sure. Yeah, and uh, for Zhang Feng, you also mentioned about before and after a lot of changes happened and uh, you, um, you, you got the four models, now you use, yeah. Form, uh, formulate, uh, format, formalize the four models, uh, business models in your corporation. And uh, so what kind of inspiration did you get uh, through uh, becoming a B Corp? So you have that, uh, now you settle down on the four models. So I'd like to know the trigger, what happened. Okay, thank you. Mr. Ken, please. Uh, so for us, uh, one of the things we did was um, we started to talk to our staff as we were working through the process about why we were doing it and what it would mean for us. But then when we became a B Corp, um, we went to other B Corps to learn what they did. Um, there is a uh, very well-known B Corp in Australia called Silver Chef. Um, we took a team up, there was about eight of us, went up, spent a day at their office. Um, they gave us an enormous amount of time. Uh, their owner, their CEO, their head of HR, they flew people in for that meeting. Um, we spent all day there. We now have uh, ongoing connections with them where they provided material to us around how they run things. We took a lot of ideas from them. They told us things hadn't worked well, so we didn't do those or we, we found a way to do them better. And then one thing, and then we went to the, uh, the B Corp conference that was at Alice Springs in Australia. And, and I actually took along someone who was going to be running the B Corp committee who was very committed and I took along my head of marketing who was thought it was a bad idea. And I took him deliberately because I thought, well, I'm not going to convince him by just telling him. And literally within a day or two, he was an absolute advocate of what we were doing. And so um, I, I would strongly suggest you, you, if it comes from you at the top of the company, it will fail. You have to show commitment and uh, an absolute uh, alignment with what you're doing. But the day-to-day -day work, I'm too busy to run B Corp day-to-day -day in the company, but everybody knows I'm committed to it, which is why I'm here. But to run it, the B Corp committee, we have a B Corp committee that runs across the company. People nominated for that. No one was um, told to be in it. They nominated. We gave them the choice of what their direction and focus would be. And in actual fact, next week when I get back to Australia, um, there is a B Corp meeting and, um, and I've been told very clearly that I will be there, <laughs> so they will tell me what they've done. Uh, so it's not something that I'll get in a report, I'm going to sit in a room while, while they outline it, and they're very proud of that. Getting it, the, the engagement throughout the organisation uh, is, is really critical. 我, 呃, 第一个问题其实我刚才已经谈过就是希望能够让自己的品牌更清晰别人能够 
呃直接寻找到我们。第二个问题，我的理解是，就为什么我们会选择把我们的业务归到这四类？啊，然后就 B Corp 对这个事情有什么样的影响？呃，我想这样来回答您的问题。B Corp 在中国，它的作用，我现在我坦白的讲，我觉得那个作用不是那么大。嗯、呃，那我们呃做了 B Corp， 申请了 B Corp， 拿到了 B Corp 的目的是证明自我，让自己的品牌更清楚，这个目的已经达到了。但是下面呢，就是我还是一个公司，我还要生存。就我我怎么能够让我的社会理想和生存能够更好的平衡，这个是很就摆在我们面前很直接的问题。所以呢，呃，我的想法是这样，就是我们去寻找呃几个方向，我们在里边能够挣到钱，同时呢，我们的社会理想很清楚的能够表达出去，呃，这个就是我们把它类型化的最直接的动力，其实是。B c o p 呢，其实是嗯、呃、就。对员工多好，供应商的这些控制还有什么也好，呃，对我来说都是一个基础，但它不是很怎么讲，就它，它不是很主动的去寻找市场的，就所以我必须做出一些其他的改变，才能够把 B c o p 的这些基础，呃，推到市场上面去。其实是其实是有点这样一个想法，所以，呃，如果说是因为 B c o p 产生了这四个分类，我觉得也不准确，而是说，呃，如何让呃，我们的生存，也就是我们的利润和我们的社会理想能够平衡下来。所以现在这四个分类都是我们筛选，就整理了我们自己一大堆事情之后，觉得呃能够兼并兼具这两者特性的类型，其实是，其实是这样一个原因。嗯，谢谢。OK， any question more？ OK。I think we may have actually answered the question, but I really just wanted to ask each one of you that before you became, I mean, it sounds amazing, it sounds absolutely fantastic, the difference it's made to your lives and your companies, but before you became a B Corp, what now, looking back, would you think it has been the most challenging part of it? What would you change if you could or advise somebody that this is what you're going to face? What's the most challenging part of it all now, looking back? The challenge. Mr. King, <laughs> any challenge you have overcome? For us, I think it, it's been quite easier because before we got certified, this is the way that we've been operating all the businesses. And we were so happy to see the Pico because it's like uh, putting the stamp, official global stamp, that what we are doing is not bad, it's good. For example, when it comes to our governance systems, we have as many as like uh, 27 shareholders. To some, this structure is really risky, right? So when we have this system before big corporations, we didn't value our own governance systems. But when it comes to being peg assessment, when they took a look at it, they said, oh, this is fantastic because this is so distributed, right? Democratic. So that when you stumble on some issues, you are, you are resilient. So this way is kind of, you know, we start valuing what we have already. So I think uh, it's been easier quite. But if we go back, I'd like to start with um, forming small working groups among our staff members because it used to be like me and uh, the other leaders. We are uh, opening up the screen and we clicking on the questions, but I would like to start with uh, forming subcommittees consisting of uh, staff members interested in specific areas so that we have five working groups. So that we, I leave the working groups, count all the you know, questions and, and, and return with um, suggestions as to which gap and how to fill the gap. But we actually couldn't do that because we didn't have that knowledge. KK, do you have okay. any question? Uh, I, I, I don't have a question. I have an observation. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I was in part inspired by all four speakers, especially the three younger ones. Um, <laughs> Mr. Green also very really young. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, early in the morning, I, 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 I said, uh, we can take away with some knowledge yeah. and then just put it put it on our bookshelf. Yeah. But we can also be inspired by the speakers and then make, make some conscious choice what you do 
in the rest of your life. Now, I make one decision. Uh, from now on, I will, I will forget about social enterprises. <laughs> I will focus on B Corps. So we need to change the name of the summit. <laughs> our, our especially uh, relatively young people, inspire them to start B Corps, build B Corps, yeah. inspired by people like, like, like them. You, you see, they are relatively young, and they have to build really big uh, 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 corporations, B Corp, with great potential. Whereas in Hong Kong, frankly, many of our social enterprises are just contented with, with um, uh, uh, surviving. And then they feel, I, I survived five years, six years, uh, already very good. The ambition is not high. The impact is very limited. So I, I, this is just one observation. I will continue Thank to learn for this. Any questions? Young people. Yeah, okay, yeah, okay my friends. <laughs> okay, another young man. Huh? Tommy, <laughs> well, that's my point. You, you don't have to be young. It is not a young movement. It is a movement for everyone. And unless we recognize in our society that older people can contribute on and on to the end of their lives, we will not have an inclusive society. So the B Corp movement is just a young person's movement. It actually is not uh, fulfilling the values that I would hope for. It has to be an inclusive movement for everyone. And older people are just as creative and imaginative. And with their experience and contacts and maybe accumulated wealth, we can do even more than younger people. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hello, Maria? Any comments? Oh, sure. sure. Yeah, that's sure, sure. want to contribute all yeah. of yeah, sure. it. Was just, it was just it. Okay, not just contribute beer and chips. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. No, you know, there is research that shows that the companies that do better are companies that have intergenerational partners. A young partner and a partner over 50 or 60 years of age. So I think that diversity is the call for all of us, you know? I think that there is an opportunity for all of us to learn to work and to, and to love and uh, appreciate uh, working with people who are different from us because that is really what sparks innovation. Uh, so, and I, and I would like to say that also, what is wonderful about this movement is that we are finding that we can bring our values to business. You know, some, some few years ago, we thought that coming to business required us leaving our souls in our houses. The B Corps is showing us that we can be the whole person we want to be and work in business, make a profit and be the person who we want to be. So the values of diversity, trust, collaboration are all a space in business as well. Be disruptive <laughs> to think it. Uh, okay. So maybe you have the question? Okay, thank yeah, you very much. Uh, sorry, I have one question for me. Oh, uh, okay. One more, maybe you are the oh, next. Sorry, thank you. Sorry. Uh, a business host, your, uh, the founders of uh, First Response uh, were classmates from MBA or EMBA uh, program. Uh, I'd just like you to share, uh, how do you see the other classmates in, in your cohort? Co <laughs> um, is it uh, becoming uh, more uh, young people or, or people in those programs uh, more interested in business for social good? I ask because in Hong Kong, many MBA, EMBA programs, they are still uh, school in the old, old business way. Okay. So EMBA or MBA course? Oh, oh. <laughs> oh okay. Who miss me? EMBA. Uh, no, I don't know about EMBAs. <laughs> but for MBAs, for uh, definitely, it's still a very niche market for the MBAs. Because with all this time and money that you put in for such a um, high value of a program, after you graduate, unless you pursue any roles or any, any kind of positions within the corporate world, it's very difficult to them have an ROI in a very short period of time. So I'm the only one um, out of my class, and I think for a very long time, that I pursue a mission-driven driven career. 
but definitely not in China, but overseas that I see a lot of cases where MBAs are actually adapting to the whole concept of B Corps and teaching more students about the way they actually do businesses. So this is a very slow change that's happening in academic institutions, starting from overseas, very unfortunately, but that's something that we're trying to create because we're all from uh, MBA and EMBA schools. We're also trying to use our part and use our network in order to influence if there's any way that we can create these courses and a B Corp at our school. If not, then any other schools in China. OK, thank you. Yeah, uh, adding to that, I think the career path to this mis mission-driven companies, I think, becoming uh, you know strengthened. And then I last year we got an email from a, a recent Oxford Business School MBA graduate, and she asked about can can I actually work with us? And then I asked uh, her back, how did you find us? We're such a small company, <laughs> and she was in actually the UK, right? And then she went to the uh, career advisor. And she said, OK, this is something that I'd like to work for. And then the Korea advisor in UK, he actually mentioned that, OK, if you go back to Korea, just Google B Corps. And then when you, you, know, you know, see the findings around the B Corps, just uh, try that. So we can see you know, many millennials, you know, they actually seeking for purposes, and they're not knocking <coughs> on opportunities working with uh, B Corps. So I am positive on that you know, change. So thank you, that lady. I, I just want to make a comment. I think thanks for the very enlightening presentations. Um, uh, the point is, in the past 10 or 20 years, in Hong Kong particularly, uh, we have been trying to put or introduce businesses into social services. I mean, a lot of non-profit organizations, uh, NGOs, have been tasked to set up social enterprises. And uh, frankly speaking, it's very difficult because, you know, being a you know, social worker or counselor or, you know, doing the non-profit organization, social services, it's very difficult to do businesses. But now I've heard the, the other side, you know, introducing social services in businesses. I think probably that's even a more viable and more sustainable uh, direction for us to take. And, and that's very encouraging, something for us to, to think about. Um, another thing that, that I've been thinking of is one of the things that we have been trying to do in our social enterprises is to, in Hong Kong, is to employ people from a disadvantaged background or people with um, handicaps or less, um, uh, you know, privilege with some kind of special needs. So maybe that's something which the B Corps could look into in, you know, how can we you know, uh, you know, employ or use some of those kinds of resources in our community. Thank you. That's why we are engaging the business sector to join the B Corp movement. If not advocating the NGO, we are more focusing on the business sector. Mr. Ken, you have some comments? Um, when I mentioned the things we were doing as a business before we became a B Corp, part of it was around disability. I have a son with Down syndrome, so I've been very heavily involved in the intellectual disability community for a long period of time around Australia. And um, uh, what I've now done is separate to Aspen, but, but something that I've run for a number of years, is uh, we were talking about housing affordability before. Well, in Australia, if you have an intellectual disability, you have the lowest rate of home ownership of any sector in Australia. Uh, it's the worst of, of, of every single sector. And so while everybody's talking about housing affordability up here, they're down here. And typically they will only have the opportunity of a group home. So sharing a residential home where um, they share everything with people they didn't get to choose to live with. So a few years ago, uh, myself and three other people started to develop a model where we looked at social housing but from a business point of view. And we said, can we make this a social business? So it doesn't benefit shareholders, it benefits uh, the business itself to develop more housing. We've now developed a financial model that allows us to build a home ownership for people with an intellectual disability, pay, pay for it out of their pension, um, and then when they've learnt not only all the skills to live independently but have the money now, we sell on their behalf to another person with an intellectual disability. So we're taking people out of social housing, we're giving them home ownership and we're moving them in to uh, home ownership. It's the only model like it in Australia. We think it's the only one like it in the world. We've already built 20 homes. We're building another 10. We have 37 people on the waiting list for those 10. We have 200 people in Melbourne who want us to build there. And we've now started to expand the model out to support other disadvantaged homeowners, 
particularly uh, women escaping domestic violence and older women with no superannuation or savings who are now starting to live homeless. Um, that model is self-funding. Once it got started and it needed some support, it's now self-funding and the Australian government is now talking about how they can help us scale to set up an impact investment fund purely for that uh, of $100 million to build them around Australia. So I think you're exactly right. It's how we, we learn those lessons of business and you know turn them for, for the people who have none of the privileges or opportunities that we do. Thank you very much. Yeah. So I think uh, time is uh, really short. Okay, so I think we need to close the sharing section and the QAM section. So uh, taking this opportunity, opportunity, I would like to, on behalf of the organizing committee, to present some of the souvenir to all our great speakers. Okay, first lady, Mr. Kang. Thank you very much. Okay. So to conclude this section, you can see that uh, from now on, social enterprise also, although KK is saying that, okay, no more, but we still need some young entrepreneur to have the social enterprise to seed the ideas. But for the business sector, that means those of us, okay, if you are from the business sector, especially at the CEO level or even the shareholders level, just like Mr. Glenn said, we need to work it fast and act by ourselves, top down. Don't just ask your marketing officer, don't just ask your CR, CSR manager to attend some kind of no matter it's being called creating shared values forum. Because in order to push or to force start this kind of the new movement, the shareholder, the top management need to be the leader to force start this move. As well as you said that from NGO, we cannot without you. You need to use your expertise to solve the social problems. But we think that the business cannot be do the business as usual. We need to have a very disruptive business model to do business, but at the same time, we address some of the social issue. We cannot only rely on the policy from our government. Government, I think, can be a facilitator just like what Mr. Kim and what Mr. Kim said that if we have some great ideas, the government can play a very important role to, facil to facilitate us to scale up our solution. So in later on, I would like to announce that because in the past year, uh, the Social Entrepreneurship Forum and also the Education for Good, okay, founded by Mr. KKJ. And actually, Mr. KKJ is also one of the board of directors and also the co-founder of the Social Entrepreneurship Forum. As I mentioned, that I'm the current chairman. Uh, we are so lucky that in the past year, we, promote, we are promoting the Big Cop in Hong Kong. Right now, we have a three successful cases certifying to be the Big Cop. But in the past year, we have a lot of the uh, training sections, sharing section conducted by uh, KK, a group of people called B Corp Consultants Group, okay? Right now, at least 10 or 20 corporations are applying or considering to be the B Corp. 
and we are lucky to announce that, that maybe we will have a further collaboration with the B Lab, and we are intended to be the B Market uh, builder in Hong Kong, so as to bear the responsibility to promote the B Corporation in Hong Kong. So that maybe later term, because I know that Mr. Kim, you are going to be the B Market builder in Korea. You can see that B Corp is really a big organization. We can share, we can uh, interfere with each other with the same goal is to do the best for our society, not only for our profit. So today, on behalf of the organizing committee, thank you for your coming. So it's the time to have our lunch. But please make sure that two o'clock come back to another section. KK, thank you very much. Thank you.